Okay, so good morning everyone. So let's start the morning session. Uh, in this session, uh, we have two speakers. Uh, they will discuss the theory of, uh, quant uh, of quantum spin liquid. Uh, as mentioned, uh, the questions during the talks are encouraged. Okay, the first speaker is uh, uh, Professor Natalia uh, Parkins, uh, University of Minnesota. Uh, she will tell us uh, probing Kita F spin liquid. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank organizers for organizing this great meeting in a great location. It's always a pleasure to come here. And I'm very happy that my talk is in the morning. So listening about uh, Kitaev spin liquid and, uh, oops, sorry, learn. Uh, oops, okay. And uh, hearing about uh, continuum in Kitaev spin liquid will not take you away of watching uh, the beautiful uh, sunset uh, in Trieste. So profit the evenings. Okay. Uh, before start, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, my collaborator. So basically, what I'm going to present comes from uh, different work, and most of the results which I will be talking today was obtained with, in collaboration with uh, Gabor Halas, but also we uh, have some contribution with uh, Jeroen van der Brink, Brent Perot, uh, Yonis Rusakatsakis, Stefanos Kurtis, and Johannes Knolli, so different uh, aspect of the uh, talk were presented in the collaboration with these uh, people. Uh, and I will start with uh, discussing, I'm talking about uh, quantum uh, spin liquids. And uh, during uh, the years, this, this subject, first of all, was uh, interesting to condense many people already for many years. But the definition, what is, uh, what is the quantum spin liquid, changed with uh, time. Uh, Quantum spin liquid is a state of interacting spins. It's usually uh, the state in the insulator that breaks no rotational or translational symmetry and has only a short range uh, co correlation. And basically, in this uh, kind of older definition, you only say uh, what quantum spin liquid do not have. It do not have any uh, local order. But, uh, and this, um, the idea of quantum spin liquid is actually uh, trace back to the uh, pioneering work of uh, Anderson, who proposed uh, a resonant, uh, resonating valence bond state. And this is uh, the prototype of the modern uh, quantum spin liquid. Uh, and as I said, so unlike the states with long reach order, uh, quantum spin liquids are not localized uh, by, are not characterized by any local order parameter. And therefore, it's quite difficult to probe uh, this uh, quantum spin liquid. What are the ex experimental probes for this uh, state? However, uh, now we understand the development in the, uh, from the theoretical uh, side during the last, I would say, 20 or so years. Uh, people understood that quantum spin liquid are characterized by topological order and long range uh, entanglement. However, uh, there are no probe known today which would be directly coupled to topological order or directly uh, probe long-range uh, entanglement. So we have to deal with the conventional probes, those probes which were experimental probes which were developed over years, and uh, therefore uh, signatures of uh, quantum order, which is mainly in the excitation spectrum and excitation characterized with a fractional uh, quantum number and anionic statistics. And what we want, we want to see the features of this uh, fractionalized excitation in the dynamical uh, probes. So uh, the focus of my talk is on the Kitaev spin liquid. And uh, there are two reasons for that. Uh, Kitaev spin liquid uh, is exactly solvable. And I will say a few words about uh, the exact solution. But also what is very important that there are several uh, candidate materials which can show at least a uh, dominant Kitaev interaction. And uh, the experimental relevance comes bo both in a uh, two-dimensional system and three-dimensional system. The expedition starts with uh, sodium and uh, lithium iridate, and uh, Hide Takagi was one of the pioneers uh, in this field. Then. Uh, from two-dimensional materials, 
uh, the most discussed and probably one of the best candidates for Kitaev spin liquid are uh, ruthenium chloride uh, compound. However, both these two compounds are order below a certain temperature. And uh, recently, it was a beautiful study of hydrogen intercalated uh, lithium iridate. Again, uh, this uh, study was done by a group of Hide Takagi, and this is the compound which shows uh, no range, uh, no long range order down to very, very low uh, temperature. There are also uh, other materials uh, which are Kitaev system in three dimension, and I will uh, talk about this later. Okay, so as I said, uh, let's leave with what we have, and therefore quantum spin liquid, we have a hope that quantum spin liquid uh, can be detected by looking to the signatures of fractionalization of excitations in dynamical probe. It can be done with inelastic neutron scattering, Raman scattering with visible light, resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, and also now there are some studies about the ultrafast uh, spectroscopy. Of course, few features can also be uh, understood by looking at thermodynamics and uh, thermal transport. And what is interesting that since now we have these candidate materials, there are a lot of experimental activity in all these uh, fields trying to look to Kitaev materials and see, do we indeed see some uh, features of uh, Kitaev spin liquid? So uh, since uh, this fractionalized excitation, they carry a fractional uh, quantum number, fractional to the local degrees of freedom, which correspond to the spin uh, flip, which is a magnum and has S1 half, only multiple uh, quasi-particles can uh, couple to the external prop. Because the external prop, what it does, it flips the spins. And therefore, the response from quantum spin liquid is always in multi-particle continuum. And we know that this continuum can be very different. It can be constituted from different parts. It can have different shape. And to be sure that what we see as some broad features has some relation to the features of the Kitaev uh, quant to quantum spin liquid in general, we need to compare experimental results with uh, theoretical calculation, and this theoretical calculation should be done in a reliable way, which is not always easy to do. Okay, so the simple example, what is a fractionalized excitation, can be seen in a spin one-half uh, chains, and basically what you have here, so if you have a 1D chain, imagine that the neutron is coming, flipping one spin, and then what you create, you create two unhappy bonds, and the energy depends on the number of these unhappy bonds. You can flip further on, and you see that these kinks or these uh, spin-ons can freely propagate because you're not creating in one dimension any new uh, unhappy bonds. So, and then you can think about these spin-ons as a freely propagating uh, particles. And what is also great that in 1D, we have some exact solution. We can use better ansatz those who knows how to do it. And you can compute what is the constitution of uh, this uh, continuum. And basically in this compound, uh, the excellent uh, agreement was uh, achieved between the experimental results, which were published in the uh, paper by Bella Lake, and the better and that's theoretical calculation. So they actually even compare what is really two uh, spin on uh, uh, contribution, four spin on contribution, and basically the agreement is really uh, excellent. So they can do the full analysis of this. And uh, this quantitative uh, agreement. For student, what would be the spectrum of the excitation if this is not fractionalized? What is the main difference in this picture from the point of view of theoretical prediction? If you don't have fractionalized spin, this is just a spin wave dispersion that we see there. So what is the, the, the remarkable new... This is the spin on dispersion. Exactly. Yes. But if the state is not fractionalized, is what would be the expectation? If the spectrum is not fractionalized, then you will have a spin wave excitation. And spin wave excitation will be in the probes, will be seen in this very sharp mode. So uh, the existence of the, the continuum itself. Between, thanks for the question. Excellent question. So basically the difference between the response in quantum spin liquid and the response in magnetically ordered states that you don't see any sharp response. Instead, 
you see some continuum. And then you have to analyze the bounds of this uh, continuum, but also what are the intensities in this uh, continuum. And as I said, so uh, in order to be sure that you understand where this continuum is coming from, you need to compare with some theoretical results. You need to have a model, you need to do the calculation, and then you have to check are you getting uh, agreement with experiment or not. In 2D, it's much more difficult because uh, for most uh, quantum spin liquid which are available in 2D, there are no exact solution, and if you do the calculation, then the usual approach will be some parton mean field theory, except this Kitaev material. So basically, Kitaev uh, materials are so promising to help us to understand uh, what is the nature of, Kitaev spin, of quantum spin liquid in two dimension and three dimension, because both in two dimension and three dimension, we have limits, the pure Kitaev model, which has exact solution, and therefore we can compute different types of uh, dynamical response exactly. And therefore, again, at least we have some limit how to compare uh, experimental results with the theory. So uh, what is Kitaev spin liquid? And here I will profit a lot from the talk by uh, Yuji Matsuda, who gave excellent uh, introduction to uh, Kitaev uh, spin liquid. But what is important is that Kitaev Hamiltonian, which was proposed in 2006, work in uh, materials with uh, free coordination. So it doesn't matter if it's two-dimensional or three-dimensional. What you need, you need to have three types of bonds which form 120 degrees in between, and only three of them. In this case, you can write this Hamiltonian in the written such that in each type of bond, for example, in this vertical bond, this is nothing else as the honeycomb lattice, you have only one type of bond interacting. Let's say Z, bond is, uh, Z component of spin is interacting. And on the other two, X and Y component is interacting. And as it was shown that uh, this model can have exact solution, not only in 2D for the honeycomb lattice, but it's different version uh, in 3D. So this one is called stripey honeycomb, and you can understand how to get this lattice from uh, honeycomb lattice. You take every second layer of the honeycombs, you cut this Z-bone, every second Z-bone, and you rotate this honeycomb stripe by 90 degrees, and then you have new stripes of the honeycomb going in this direction. And then you can also get the uh, hyper honeycomb. These two three-dimensional lattices are particularly important. I will talk also about other uh, three-dimensional lattices because there are experimental realization of the material which has exactly these uh, structures. Uh, where exact solution is coming from? Exact solution is uh, coming because in this Hamiltonian, there is uh, a large number of conserved uh, quantity, and this conserved quantity are local plaquette operators, this WP. So if it's just for honeycomb, let me explain everything for the honeycomb. Generalization for three-dimensional models are very simple. So you have this honeycomb, what you construct here, you take the, you, you go along this, uh, honeycomb along this plaquette, and you multiply a particular uh, component of the spin, and actually this particular component corresponding to the type of the outgoing bond, which is not belonging to this uh, plaquette. So importantly, all these WP for any plaquette commute with the Hamiltonian, so it's the integral of motion, and that's why it's and that's why it's uh, exactly solvable, but it's also important that it's a good basis because this plaquette operator from the different plaquettes, they also commute. And basically, this construct the eigenvalues for these operators are plus minus one, so this is the uh, Z2 variables. And if WP uh, is equal to one, we say that this plaquette has zero flux, and if it's minus one, we say that the, uh, this plaquette has flux pi. So uh, the genius of uh, Kitaev was showing that uh, it's possible to, uh, to map these spin operators to the Majorana fermions. So now each spin is uh, represented with four Majorana fermions, three corresponding having some spin component, and one uh, Majorana fermion is just neutral uh, uh, Majorana fermions. And if you do uh, this, you rewrite the Hamiltonian using this uh, Majorana fermionization, 
then you see that uh, the Hamiltonian can be written like this. What is important that there is another variable, so from two of these uh, Majorana fermions, uh, you can construct the bond variable. So for example, if this is the Z bond, you can take SZ, SZ, two Majorana fermions with Z flavor. And what is important that these uh, link variables are also static uh, variables. And basically, this plaquette operator can be rewritten in terms of these uh, variables. So it's also static. And therefore, you can put the expectation value here. So you can now look to the system as the different configuration of these U variables, which define what is the flux configuration. And in each of these flux configuration, you have quadratic Hamiltonian for C Majorana fermions, which now on I will call Majorana fermions, and this U I will call flux variables because they create fluxes. So basically how we can look uh, to uh, Kitaev spin liquid is like this. So if we have either temperature or we have some perturbation away from the Kitaev model, what do we have? We have some amount of fluxes, and actually if we have perturbation, then these fluxes are not anymore static, but if you excite them with temperature, they are still fluxes. So fluxes are this red, where you have this WP equal to minus one, and on top of this, you have dispersive uh, gapless or gapped uh, Majorana fermions, and gapless or gapped, it depends on these parameters. If you are around the isotropic point, then excitations are gapless, and if you are away, then excitations are gapped. And in the case of isotropic point, uh, on the honeycomb lattice, the excitation like this. So this is the Majorana fermions, and you see that there are two half Dirac cones here and there, and these are the excitation which we want to probe. So uh, now with this generalization uh, to uh, 3D uh, materials, and uh, this, is, uh, this was in detail discussed by uh, Maria Hermans, there are many of them. Actually, the number of three-dimensional lattice is very, very large, and uh, this is the hyper honeycomb, or very similar, the stripy honeycomb lattice. Uh, this is the hyperhexagon, and this is the hyperoctagon. Uh, so what is different? In three dimension, we have a multi sublattice uh, system, and we have more sublattices. Nevertheless, we can still define what are the minimal plaquette. We can still define the plaquette operators, and again, in the pure Kitaev model, they are static. And for Majorana fermions, for the C Majorana fermions, we will have some dispersive band structure. And what is important that the nodal structure of these band structures, where are the zeros, uh, depend on the, how the symmetry are acting on these structures. And what I should say, because we are dealing not with electrons but with the Majorana fermions, the symmetries like time reversal and inversion are acting projectively into the Majorana fermions. And for these lattice, you have a closed line of the Dirac cones. So here we have uh, the discrete point uh, of uh, well, discrete well points, and for the hyper uh, octagon, we can have a uh, Fermi surface. So basically, we have very different uh, type of the nodal structures. So, and another important, uh, very important part in the development of this field comes from the work by Jacelli and Haliulin, which actually told us in which materials we should look for, uh, for this uh, Kitaev system, and they showed that what is important is to have strong spin-orbit coupling and uh, this pseudo-spin one-half degrees of freedom, which can be realized in these ions. So this is this isospin, which in particular geometries like this, which was discussed in, the, in detail uh, uh, by uh, Yuji Matsuda, the effective Hamiltonian, the effective low energy Hamiltonian is the dominant Kitaev interaction plus some other terms. And these, of course, are the terms, they are perturbation, they will kill Kitaev spin liquid and eventually will lead to long range order. So once again, a few more words about the experimental realization. It's the sodium iridate nail temperature is 15 Kelvin. The ground state is zigzag. This is alpha iridate nail temperature is 14 Kelvin. The ground state is incommensurate spiral, rotating carat, nail temperature 7 Kelvin, zigzag long range order. Once again, this is very nice exception where no long range order was uh, determined, so it's a potential uh, spin liquid, and probably in this compound, disorder plays a very important role. So you see there is a very complicated uh, 
structures, very complex uh, long-range magnetic order at low temperature. Still, for some reason, we are looking for Kitaya features in these materials. And these are three-dimensional realization, as I said, in beta iridate with te nil temperature 37 Kelvin, this hyper honeycomb lattice is realized. And in the gamma iridate, uh, nil temperature is 40, 37 Kelvin, this stripy, uh, stripy honeycomb structure is realized. So you see that there is already a big experimental development in last nine years. So uh, now basically the question is, is can we observe simple Kitaya physics in this very complex real, uh, Kitaya materials with very complex uh, low temperature magnetic orders? And in this case, the kind of goal of my talk is very opposite of what was discussed uh, in the first days, like you have iron selenium, such a simple structure, and you beautifully show uh, very complex and non-trivial physics in this compound. So here we have opposite, uh, opposite problem, we have complex structure, still we want to look to something uh, eventually very simple. So, and this is a view, so maybe some other people have a different view for the Kitaev materials, but here this is the temperature, and here is the perturbation, this other interaction. So basically, the, and that can be, this is shown for 2D, but the same idea works for uh, 3D materials. So basically, the idea is that this is the Kitaev T equals zero, uh, and no perturbation, this is the Kitaev point. And that, that's exact solution. So what happens when we don't have perturbation? Then thermally, at very low temperature, because flux excitations are gap, the only excitation which you have are my runner fermions. Then flux start uh, excited, and basically you have a region where you still have some disorders of flux configuration, and you see that the energy scale K is very is very large energy scale in this problem. So basically here, and then my runner fermions are moving in the soup of some uh, fluxes. And then you go to conventional paramagnet. So what happened when you include perturbation, basically this perturbation will set up these uh, long range orders I was talking about. And then, uh, of course, Kitaev spinning could have some stability, but it's, we see that it's quite fragile with respect to perturbation. And then we have long range order. The excitation in the long range order will be conventional magnets, so sharp quasi particles. And what we will see, we will see some sort of nil temperature which will grow with the strength of perturbation. And basically, we have two energy scales. One is nil temperature, and another is energy of the magnets. Uh, and basically, uh, only above these temperatures in energy scale, we should, leave to, we should look for uh, fractionalized features. And in the Kitaev model, these Majorana fermions, they are free particles, so they are infinite lifetime. And if the perturbations are small, we can still think that these fractionalized quasi-particles are long-lived. You mean, uh, okay, so, um, oops, sorry. Oops, just a second. So, uh, here is crossover for 2D. So, if you go here, it's a crossover. Uh, if you go here, it's most likely the first order, but nobody showed this, uh, uh, how to say, uh, I think it's still an open question, but the way how it was shown, it's, it's most likely the first order. Okay, so, and what I want to say that that's what people, what experimentalists are doing, they are looking for the features uh, at temperatures above nil temperature and at energies above the energy scale corresponding to the long range order. And indeed, this is the result from an elastic neutron scattering uh, from Arnab uh, Banerjee. This is the Raman scattering, and there is uh, also, uh, other probes, there is still no rigs, uh, and I will talk mostly about rigs. So, and there is a very nice, uh, very kind of pedagogical review in the paper by Johannes Knolle and Merstner, which you can find uh, here about the Kitaev spin liquid. And what we also heard that uh, thermal Hall effect indicates that there are certain regimes where we can see the, uh, the features of uh, the fractionalized excitation, and that was 
uh, told uh, by Yuji Masuda on Tuesday in his very beautiful talk. So let me say what is our proposal. So we also propose that one probe which was not yet used but should be used probably is RIGS. And RIGS can probe both two-dimensional and three-dimensional uh, Kitaev spin liquid. And what is important that contrary to inelastic uh, neutron scattering, uh, RIGS probes each type of the fractionalized excitation independently, Majorana fermions and Z2 fluxes. And basically, these are our main findings, that there are uh, four independent RIGS channels, uh, and there is no interference between them. Three of them are non-spin conserving channel, and basically they pick up a flux and they have little dispersion and they are very similar to inelastic neutron scattering. And there is one which I will discuss the most, is spin conserving channel, which directly probes uh, Majorana fermions. And uh, basically uh, what we showed that uh, spin conserving Greek channel allowed to study the uh, temp is allowed to study the nodal structure in this uh, Kitaev spin liquid, but also allows us to study the temperature evolution of momentum energy uh, map of excitation in the Kitaev spin liquid. So in brief, uh, Riggs, yes, Riggs is uh, uh, two uh, photon process. So basically you have a photon coming, it's observed, the system is going to the intermediate state, and then in other dipole transition, the photon is released, and the uh, system is going to one of the possible uh, final states. So uh, in, in, um, in short, once again, uh, since the energy of the photon is very large, the electron which is pumped, it lives in the core level. So the electron from the core level is pumped into valence band, and the core level create the potential. And then uh, there is a, uh, the photon is going out, and once again, uh, the, we can see what is the excitation of the system. And what we observe that excitation of the system should have the Q momentum K prime minus K and also the energy. So, and if I skip this, so if we look to uh, sodium iridate, then how we can think about this? So in this case, we have a direct Riggs process, and this is L3H, so, and in L3H, iridium has not bad uh, resolution, it's about uh, 3.8 milli electron volt, and in this case, the core electron is excited directly in the 5D level. And then the final state in the spin conserving channel is such that the spin in 5D channel remains the same. That's why it's called spin conserving. So we do not excite any fluxes, but instead we can excite Majorana fermions. So at zero temperature, we can only excite two, four, and so on Majorana fermions. But if we are at finer temperatures, then basically other processes are possible. Uh, in the ruthenium chloride, in uh, LH, the resolution is very bad, and actually we have to look to the KH. In an KH, it's amazing that uh, silicium analyzer gives amazingly good resolution, around 0.75 electron volt, but in this case, we are dealing with indirect Riggs process, so the electron is excited from core 1 as level to 5P, and uh, Basically, it's create the core hole potential, which modify the coupling around this, uh, around this particular site. And this excitation, intermediate state, is very short uh, leaf. And then, once again, if the final state is like this, we can see the Majorana Fermion excitation. So, uh, because I have really very few minutes, let me skip the formalism. It's very standard. You first, in order to compute uh, intensity, you need uh, to first uh, realize in which polarization channel you stay. Then you compute the amplitude using the Kramers uh, Heisenberg uh, formula. Uh, so you do this analysis of polarization, and uh, basically the spin conserving channel is, this one is A1G channel, and these are the uh, three non-spin conserving channels. And in the spin non-conserving channels, again, in the final state, you have uh, two flux excitation. So once again, skipping this, the only thing what I will say that in all these materials, gamma, this inverse lifetime of the core hole is very large, much larger than the excitation, and therefore we can do the perturbation, in the calculation we can do the perturbation in terms of one of a gamma. And uh, let me uh, tell you about the results in uh, spin conserving channels. So, uh, once again, we are interested in the inelastic response, and these come in the first order in one over gamma. 
Okay, so results. Results in 2D. That's the spectrum which uh, we uh, obtain. So basically now we can address the whole spin-on continuum. It's not only Q equals zero continuum. It has all this Q dependence. This is energy. This is Q dependence. And we can compute this exactly. And we see that gapless response for isotropic model appears exactly as it should. So there are few number, a few points, few gapless uh, points. So this is the response. And what is also important that intensity is suppressed around uh, the gamma point. Uh, at finite temperature, what happening? So the evolution at finite temperature is like this. So as I said, that at low temperature, flux are not excited, and we are probing only Majorana fermion in a zero flux sector. Then there is intermediate temperature where we are probing Majorana fermions in the presence of disordered flux configuration. And then at high temperature, it's uh, the paramagnet. And that's how we should modify the formula for uh, Rick's intensity. So these are the uh, Rick's vertices, which uh, give us the contribution. So, and this is what I was showing in my first slide. So at t equals zero, you only have a stock response. You can only create Majorana fermions in the finite state. And you see all these sharp features which are coming from fractionalization of uh, exact Kitaev spin liquid. And then with temperature, what you see that you should, uh, you start populating this uh, anti-stocks uh, channel. And if you go to very high temperature, then the stocks and anti-stocks channels are nearly symmetric. Um, very quickly, this, uh, what is the result for this 3D uh, Kitaev spin liquid? Once again, what we want to see how this nodal structure line or points or uh, Fermi surface appear in the responses. So in this hyper honeycomb uh, lattice, we compute the response. And we see that in most parts of this white dot corresponds to the place where we do have gap, because it's not really well seen here. But in most part of the brilliant zone, we have a gapless uh, responses. So this is the hyperhexagon lattice where we have this discrete number of uh, whale point, and you see that in the response, there is only a discrete number of uh, gapless points. And once again, we, these features are all computed exactly. And once again, when you have a Fermi surface, then almost all response is uh, gapless. Unfortunately, I have no time to go into more details here. And the last comments, uh, this is my last before last slide. So it's on generic uh, Kitaev spin liquid. So basically, the idea is that was the result, exact result computed, computed for models which are actually not realized in the real material. So this is this other terms, this perturbation which are important. So the high energy response will be very robust. So what all these features which we propose for high energy, they will stay more or less the same for other terms perturbation. However, the low energy response, of course, will be uh, sensitive to the uh, perturbation, but it will also depend what symmetry are, break, are broken by this uh, perturbation and uh, basically, uh, in this hyper honeycomb and stripe honeycomb lattice, uh, this nodal line remains in this plane as long as this perturbation do not break this twofold uh, symmetry uh, around uh, the axis. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.